Hi, I'm Krista Slowatsky. Um, I'm a member of the abdominal imaging section at the NYU Langone Medical Center in New York City. And what I'd like to do is to share some challenging diagnoses that my colleagues and I have encountered in the course of our work in imaging the female pelvis. Okay, our first patient is a 32-year-old woman who presented to the emergency room with extensive vaginal bleeding, cramping, and a prior syncopal episode and had a hematocrit of uh, 27%. And these are the initial transabdominal images that were obtained. Uh, these are the endovaginal images. And um, the ultrasound findings uh, ask what is within the endometrial cavity, what is expanding the endometrial cavity, and what is this spongiform hypervascular area in the uterine fundus represent, and what do the color and spectral Doppler tracings show, and what would you recommend next, if anything? Uh, well, um, we had a diagnosis uh, proposed, and an MRI was performed which showed multiple flow voids in the area of the uterine fundus. And the postgadolinium images showed brisk enhancement of these abnormal vessels in the myometrium with extension to the submucosa and the mucosal layer. Um, there was a uterine arteriovenous uh, malformation with early drainage into the right hypogastric vein. And uh, this is an image uh, where the patient was uh, treated with embolization with a small volume of NBCA adhesive, showing the final result where the AVM was uh, successfully embolized. So this was a uterine arteriovenous malformation. Uh, these are very rare in non-pregnant women and were first described in 1926. Arteriovenous malformations can be congenital or acquired and have been reported over a wide range of ages. Most congenital uterine uh, AVMs are isolated anomalies but can occur in association with AVMs at other sites. They have uh, multiple vascular connections and tend to invade the surrounding structures when they're congenital. They are believed to result from arrested vascular embryologic development and bleeding is the major presenting symptom in AVMs. Acquired causes are numerous uh, and I think the most common would be a previous pregnancy and here uh, we show an AVM post-termination of pregnancy which uh, resolved spontaneously and has features that are similar to the congenital AVM showed, however, the uh, vascular structures uh, are, were not as prominent. And the management depends on presentation, location, and the need to preserve fertility. And the options can be conservative, surgical, or a, as in our patient, endovascular. The second patient is a 41-year-old woman, 18 weeks pregnant, with ongoing left-sided pain throughout pregnancy and was found to have a large left adnexal mass. These are the images of the live fetus, and in the left adnexa you can see this very large, up to 15 centimeters, bilobed mass. The superior component of the mass, if you see, look at it, uh, really reminds you of a mature cystic teratoma with cystic components as well as these shadowing echogenic foci. However, the inferior component of the mass is solid and vascular and shows no demarcation with the dome of the urinary bladder. And endovaginal images were obtained 
and we were sure that we were in the urinary bladder by showing the urethra and there is extensive debris within the urinary bladder and we, when we extend to the dome of the urinary bladder we see soft tissue with associated vascularity which confirmed involvement of the urinary bladder by this mass. The patient had undergone an MR at an outside hospital from which she was referred and these are the sequential coronal titubated images showing invasion of the urinary bladder. There was also some question of invasion of the myometrium, however because of the lack of gadolinium administration uh, this could not be confirmed. The intraoperative findings showed a large left ovarian mass with extensive surrounding adhesions the solid component involved the urinary bladder dome. There was, however, no myometrial extension. And surprisingly, the initial frozen section was indeterminate uh, with uh, a finding of either malignant degeneration of a teratoma or inflammatory pseudotumor. However, the final diagnosis was concurrent with our initial diagnosis, which was malignant degeneration of a teratoma into a squamous cell carcinoma within the solid component. Uh, this is a CT image uh, which shows the same process in a different patient. Malignant degeneration occurs in approximately 2% of mature cystic teratoma and differentiated tissue give rise to either sarcoma or carcinoma. The most common degeneration is squamous cell carcinoma arising from the squain mislining of the cyst. It usually occurs in women uh, a bit older than our patient in the sixth and seventh decade of life. And the preoperative diagnosis is difficult in absence of either metastasis, as shown in this peritoneal implant, or local extension, as shown by this extensive extension into the adjacent small bowel loop. Our third patient is a 34-year-old woman with acute right lower quadrant pain without leukocytosis or fevers, and the patient is 32 weeks pregnant. So these are the transabdominal ultrasound images, which are uh, high up in the pelvis anteriorly and laterally. The ultrasound findings show an enlarged right ovary with multiple cystic components as well as this central echogenic component. No blood flow could be delineated and the mass corresponded to the area of the patient's pain. The left ovary was also evaluated, was also enlarged and showed a large solid echogenic component flow was seen along the periphery of the ovary and upon further questioning the patient reported prior surgical removal of a dermoid but was not really sure which side the operation had involved. And our assessment was torsion of a right ovarian mature cystic teratoma. However, the clinicians did not feel that the clinical picture was consistent with torsion and the patient underwent a CT scan to evaluate for appendicitis at the request of the clinical team. And here are the uh, CT images both in axial and coronal projections. Note the uh, bilateral dermoids. The, uh, appendix, uh, which is not visualized, not shown here, was normal. And notice how superiorly displaced this right ovary, both ovaries are, but the right ovary is almost touching the um, liver. And the patient finally did go to uh, um, laparotomy, and uh, because of her advanced uh, pregnancy, this needed to be done uh, as a laparotomy and the right ovary was found to be enlarged and necrotic and on histologic examination was a necrotic uh, mature cystic teratoma and the vascular pedicle was twisted five times. So uh, the take home message is don't forget to routinely image the ovaries in pregnancy and the sooner in pregnancy that you image them the better. Uh, this patient had 
was in the third trimester and had had several prior imaging. Uh, however, the adnexa had not been interrogated. This is a 65-year-old woman who's had a TAH BSO for fibroids eight years ago. She had just completed treatment for invasive ductal carcinoma of the breast six months ago and is currently in remission and was incidentally found to have a tenfold elevation of a CA125 and was asymptomatic. And uh, starting with the transabdominal images, we already see that there is some abnormality in the uh, cul-de-sac. And these are the endovaginal images showing a large uh, 5.6, up to 5.6 centimeter complex mass. The mass shows both solid and cystic components. And the ultrasound findings were felt to be compatible with a um, vascular mass that had a, the sonographic appearance of a primary ovarian neoplasm. However, the ovaries and uter uterus were not visualized compatible with the patient's history of a prior TEH slash BSO. The CT findings, uh, there was no ascites or omental nodularity, no associated adenopathy, or, and no foci to suggest serosal implants. So the findings appear to be limited to the pelvis. And on histopathologic examination, this was an extra ovarian primary peritoneal carcinoma. Uh, the first case of this entity of primary peritoneal carcinoma was reported in 1959, and at that time a 27-year-old woman had a papillary serous carcinoma of the peritoneum with no ovarian involvement. Uh, this is an unusual and rare entity. Uh, it has many uh, associated names. Although the precise causes are not known, there is a link between a certain variants of the BRAC gene, and furthermore, uh, women with the BRAC mutation have a 5% risk of developing this primary peritoneal carcinoma even after prophylactic ovophorectomy. And uh, the epithelial layer of the ovary and the peritoneum share a common embryologic origin, so that this entity uh, acts as an ovarian carcinoma would. It spreads intraperitoneally, and if the ovaries are involved, they are only involved by surface involvement, and the therapy is that of ovarian carcinoma. Uh, our fifth patient is a 52-year-old African-American woman with one month of vaginal bleeding and recent right leg swelling. These are the transabdominal images. In long, you see these multiple specular reflectors, uh, which are compatible with air, as well as several cystic foci. You see a very attenuated wall of the uterus, which is very enlarged. And also notice the extensive adenopathy in the right adnexa and along the right pelvic sidewall, which accounted for the patient's uh, physical findings of the right leg swelling. This is a limited uh, transvaginal examination of the cervix, and you see extension of the mass into the endocervical canal. So, uh, the patient underwent a CT scan, and there is associated retroperitoneal adenopathy further superiorly in the abdomen, and again, the right pelvic sidewall adenopathy that we saw on ultrasound. So this is a malignant mixed malarian tumor, which is a carcinosarcoma. This usually presents as a heterogeneous mass expanding the uterus, and it often protrudes through the cervical os. Uh, the, diagnos the diagnostic clue is that this is a broad-based large uterine mass with aggressive myometrial invasion, and the differential diagnosis is that of endometrial carcinoma, leiomyosarcoma, or an endometrial stromal sarcoma. Um, as a 
companion uh, case. This is a 24-year-old woman who's presented with profuse vaginal bleeding, stated that her LMP was three months ago prior with ongoing intermittent bleeding, and in all fairness, I'm withholding some clinical data. And these are transabdominal views of her uterus, which is also expanded by heterogeneous soft tissue. Both of the ovaries are normal. These are the endovaginal images. And again, we have multiple specular reflectors. However, these show shadowing that is not quite um, the specular reflectors that we saw in the previous patient. And flow is seen only in the peripheral myometrial vessels. And in this patient, the quantitative beta HCG is 444. The patient underwent endometrial curatage, and the pathology showed degenerated fetal membranes and chorionic villi. And uh, the chorionic villi had extensive stromal fibrosis and calcification along uh, involving the trophoblastic layer and were avascular precluding estimation of the gestational age. And you can see this calcified layer at the junction of this abnormal soft tissue within the endometrial cavity and the myometrium. So even though the sonographic findings may be uh, similar, the imaging findings need to be interpreted in the clinical context. Uh, this is a 30-year-old woman followed serially for an enlarging left ovarian mass throughout pregnancy. And at 15 weeks of gestational age, we have a, the left ovary here. It measures approximately 3.7 centimeters. And you can see that with advancing gestational age, the left ovary becomes more and more complex in appearance and is larger. And this is at 33 weeks gestational age. And this was a decidualized endometrioma. And endometriomas may become decidualized during pregnancy, resulting in solid vascular areas that may mimic an ovarian carcinoma. Fortunately, this is a rare occurrence, and awareness along with MR evaluation and follow-up imaging may facilitate the appropriate diagnosis. And also, this is another reason to know what the patient's ovaries look like early on in pregnancy. So if you know that the patient has had an endometrioma and you're aware of this potential complication during pregnancy, you would feel more comfortable following this patient throughout pregnancy rather than intervening surg surgically. And MR is useful because the MR signal of the decidua in the uterus is the same signal as the decidualization seen within the ovary. Our next patient is a 37-year-old woman admitted for her sixth elective uh, cesarean section. And she's had prior imaging at an outside facility that showed a placenta percreta at 21 weeks, confirmed at 31 weeks. She was referred to us for amniocentesis for fetal lung maturity, which was uh, performed at 36 weeks, six days. And the following are the ultrasound images, which were obtained at the time of the amniocentesis. And we see this very large uh, placenta previa. This is the uh, baby's head. And along with the placenta previa, there are these large venous lakes. There's extensive vascularity, which invades the anterior lip of the cervix. This is the urinary bladder. And these low resistive placental vessels come up to the serosa of the urinary bladder. And um, the patient's, the, uh, the fetal lung maturity was positive, and the patient was scheduled for a cesarean hysterectomy the next day. Uh, at that time, her hematocrit was 33. On the day of surgery, an epidural catheter was placed. She also underwent interventional uh, 
radiology balloon placement in the bilateral proximal internal iliac arteries. And that is shown here with the balloon positioning and inflation of the balloons. She underwent intraoperative cystoscopy with placement of bilateral ureteral stents. And the cystoscopic evaluation showed marked hyperemia due to the submucosal vessels, but there was no penetration of the mucosa by the placental tissue. The patient's operative course was quite long and stormy. She had dense adhesions between the bladder, the placenta, and the lower uterine segment with placental invasion through the lower uterine segment and serosa involving the bladder. The left aspect of the placenta was adherent to the bladder and a classical uterine incision was performed above the placenta. A viable male infant was delivered with good APGARs and the hysterectomy was started. And this is the intraoperative view. As I said, the operative course was quite stormy. The internal iliac balloons were inflated. Uh, the patient underwent a retrograde uh, installation of sterile milk into the bladder, which showed a uh, two centimeter cystostomy in the left dome. At this time, the patient was intubated. A supracervical hysterectomy was completed, and then bleeding was noted from aberrant vasculature from placental adhesion. A second uh, surgeon was called in, and the patient became hemodynamically unstable. And intraoperatively, the patient underwent emergent embolization of the internal iliac arteries, and this is the post-embolization angiogram. And the goal of this is for rapid per per permanent embolization of the uh, proximal hypogastric arteries. This shows the surgical specimen with these aberrant vessels noted. And this is a view of the amputated cervix. Um, all in all, the patient received 26 units of packed red blood cells 40 units of platelets, 11 units of FFP, and 11 units of cryoprecipitate. However, uh, the patient was discharged home on post-operative day six with uh, two Jackson Pratt drains and a Foley catheter bag. And on postpartum uh, follow-up, all of these were removed and she did well. So here we're dealing with placenta or accreta or percreta, and um, we know that the risk factors are previous uterine surgery, and the risk of accreta uh, rises dramatically with the number of prior cesarean sections, and the complications are transfusion infection, perinatal death, maternal death, ureteral ligation or fistula formation or spontaneous uh, uterine rupture. And the mainstay of treatment remains cesarean hysterectomy. However, it's a multidisciplinary team approach is essential to reduce neonatal and maternal morbidity and mortality, as was seen in this patient. There have been some scattered reports of methotrexate use. However, most of these uh, experience significant delayed hemorrhage. So at this time, there's insufficient evidence demonstrating safety and eff efficacy of methotrexate use. Our eighth patient is a 38-year-old woman who's had a normal spontaneous vaginal delivery in uh, December 2009. Uh, this was followed by a DNC two months later because of continued postpartum bleeding and the beta HCG was negative. Uh, this is the appearance of the placenta at 33 weeks gestational age, which shows your uh, mature placenta with calcifications. And the pathologic report at delivery of the placenta was a three-vessel cord and fetal membranes, no pathologic diagnosis, and the placenta was noted to be a third trimester placenta with some increased intervillous fibrin, increased syncytial knots and microcalcifications. This was the ultrasound two weeks following the initial DNC when the patients had continued postpartum bleeding and pain. And these are the ultrasound images. 
showing uh, this calcified, densely calcified material within the endometrial cavity. And uh, so our assessment at this time was, uh, well, what would you check at this point? And does a negative beta HCG exclude a postpartum complication? Well, we went back and looked at the pathology at the initial DNC prior to our ultrasound, and the diagnosis was products of conception with hyalinized and calcified chorionic villi and decidua consistent with retained products of conception. So we were pretty confident that we were dealing with uh, retained product of, products of conception. And this was the ultrasound following the second DNC, where we had still residual calcification outlining the, uh, outlining the endometrial lining. And our uh, assessment at this point, or our thoughts at this point, was, was there an accessory placental lobe which was overlooked prenatally? Um, so that uh, there should be, um, on the prenatal evaluation, don't forget to look for possible accessory placental lobes. A 50-year-old woman with vaginal bleeding and clinical concern for cervical carcinoma. Her clinical history is that of placement of an IUD 20 years ago. And these are the initial transabdominal images. And note this hypoechoic mass in the region of the cervix. And these are the transvaginal images. Um, and does this mass uh, remind you of anything? And uh, when I see something that reminds me of something else, um, I start to uh, approach that patient in that manner. Is this something usual in an unusual place? Uh, and the other finding is uh, we see a portion of the patient's intrauterine device which was clearly seen on these correlative CT images, which were uh, done to evaluate for possible metastatic disease. And the patient did undergo a hysterectomy for possible cervical carcinoma. However, the pathology revealed endometriosis involving the cervix with an endometriotic cyst. This is the pathologic specimen. Here you see the endocervical canal, the external cervical os, and here is the endometriotic cyst involving the cervical stroma. So when, we first, when I first looked at this image, it reminded me of an endometrioma. Um, cervical involvement by endometriosis is very uncommon. It may be an incidental microscopic finding. It may arise in a polypoid mass arising from the cervix, but it also may cause abnormal vaginal bleeding. There's often a history of prior cervical trauma, either curatage, biopsy. Uh, this patient had an IUD place, so there's a question of implantation of endometrial fragments, or does this result from malarian rests, which persist in the cervical stroma? Uh, these are all possibilities as to the etiology. Uh, our next lady is a 54-year-old woman who postmenopausal uh, noted to have a pelvic mass on physical examination. And here we see a cul-de-sac mass, and our question is, is this attached or separate from the uterus? There was an atrophic right ovary, but no left ovary was seen. So it would make a difference if this arose from the uterus or whether this arose from the left ovary. And we're fortunate in ultrasound to be able to man manipulate um, uh, the, uh, our examination. And here we see that the mass is clearly separate from the uterus. There are no bridging vessels between this mass and the uterus. So uh, we concluded that this is a cul-de-sac vascular mass, predominantly solid with some scattered cystic areas. It's separate from the uterus and therefore presumably uh, of left ovarian origin. And I would just point out that the endometrial lining was atrophic. This uh, CT was performed and uh, interpreted as, uh, the mass was interpreted as being a fibroid or a fibroma. 
and patient underwent resection of the cul-de-sac mass, and this was an endometrioid carcinoma of the left ovary. This is a subtype of epithelial ovarian neoplasm. It's the third most common ovarian malignancy after serous and mucinous cyst adenoma. It can have mixed solid and cystic uh, components. And interestingly, endometrial hyperplasia or carcinoma is seen in approximately a third of the patients as an independent primary tumor rather than a metastasis. And in younger patients, it's important to remember that this is the carcinoma that can arise within an endometrioma. A 29-year-old woman with an enlarging pelvic mass, and these are the transabdominal images. Uh, you can see that this is a very heterogeneous vascular mass, uh, but in contradistinction to the patient that uh, we saw before, we don't really see the myometrial wall here. However, the ultrasound was interpreted as representative of a large neoplasm of the endometrium. Uh, the patient, however, we found out had had an MRI at an outside institution from which uh, she was referred. And these are the gadolinium enhanced sequential T1 weighted images. And what did the MRI show that the ultrasound didn't and how did it change our diagnosis and did it affect our surgical planning? Well, here we see the uterine corpus and this is the uterine corpus is deviated all the way to the right by this large mass, and it was not visualized on the ultrasound. And the mass actually arose exophytically from the fundus of the uterus, and therefore uterine sparing resection of this mass was performed. And this is a very unusual entity. It's a low-grade leiomyosarcoma, which was thought to arise within a leiomyoma. The tumor was ERPR positive. Leiomyosarcomas usually arise from the myometrium itself or smooth muscles of the myometrial vessels, and malignant degeneration of a fibroid is extremely rare. And any rapidly enlarging uterine mass is a clinical clue for a leiomyosarcoma. 24-year-old woman with purulent vaginal discharge, and we are to evaluate her for possible pelvic inflammatory disease. And these are the um, transabdominal images. Uh, I bring your attention to the midline trans images, which show two uterine corpuses. And what are the out ultrasound findings? Well, the ovaries are normal. The vagina is filled with fluid and debris, and actually one of our, uh, the sonographer actually thought this resembled a crown rump length and perhaps the patient uh, was aborting, but however the patient was beta HCG negative. So uh, are we dealing with a uterine anomaly, and if so, what kind, and what else would we like to image? Well, we know that there's a correlation between pelvic abnormalities and renal abnormalities, and in this patient, the right kidney is enlarged, and the left kidney cannot be located. Upon further questioning, the patient relates a history of dyspareunia. So a diagnosis of uterus didelphus with an obstructed hemivagina with possible incomplete septum was proposed. And what we recommended next was an MRI, which is very helpful in delineating these pelvic uh, congenital anomalies. Here we see the uterus didelphus. And uh, this uh, MRI was performed a little bit differently than the normal uh, protocol. The patient self-inserted surgilube into the patent right hemivagina for better expansion and conspicuity. And this was the left blind ending obstructed hemivagina. And on other images, the wall of the obstructed left hemivagina enhanced due to the presence of chronic inflammation. So our final diagnosis was uterus didelphus, 
left renal agenesis, a blind ending obstructed left hemivagina, and vaginal contrast allowed for better delineation uh, of the uh, of the of both vaginal canals, and also showed us a small communication between the obstructed hemivagina and the patent hemivagina, and this likely accounted for the lack of hematometros in this patient. This has a, a, a long name. This is the uh, Harlan werner wunderlich syndrome, which basically is a uterus didelphus with an obstructed hemivagina and ipsilateral renal agenesis. This is rare. It usually presents after menarche, and the patient presents with progressive pelvic pain, and there can be hemi-hematocopus or hemipiocopus, and it's treated with, with a vaginal septectomy and drainage of the um, hematocopus or hematometrocopus. So, um, uh, I'll leave you these for uh, a discussion of the uh, Mullerian duct abnormalities, which develop from the embryonic mesoderm. Um, and this is just for your uh, perusal. This is a 37-year-old woman who presents with increasing abdominal girth. These are representative images through the abdomen. I'll bring your attention that this is the uh, coronal views of the aorta and the cava. This is the aorta here and the IVC. This is a view of the pancreas. And these are images of the right ovary. And these are um, the um, images of the this material that was seen within the uh, abdominal cavity. And these are the correlative CT images. And you see how much less tissue, uh, uh, tissue differentiation you see on CT scan because CT basically just measures density. And all of this really measures soft tissue or water density, so you don't really get the exquisite architecture that you do with sonography. And this is Pseudomyxoma peritonei of ovarian origin, which is a rare condition, and it's due to mucinous ascites with peritoneal and omental implants. It's caused by seeding of the peritoneal cavity by mucin-producing cells, and the or or organ of origin is usually the appendix or the ovary. Uh, the mainstay of treatment is surgical debulking. Uh, the recent use of heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy at the conclusion of a surgery has been quite helpful. And there, the surgeon puts on these big rubber gloves and tries to distribute chemotherapy throughout the peritoneal cavity. And the ultrasound is really quite typical, shows these echogenic, uh, poorly mobile uh, ascites. And this is the patient post-surgical debulking and heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. A uh, 35-year-old woman with right-sided pain and a beta HCG of 154. She states that her LMP was six weeks ago. And we see this is an enlarged myomatous uterus. There's no IUP. And the right ovary is really not clearly delineated uh, transvaginally. And even this portion of the ovary that was presented looks a little bit suspicious uh, with this echogenic ring in it. So we repeated the transabdominal examination. And here in the right interstitial portion of the uterus, we see an echogenic ring. It is clearly separate from the right ovary. And on this clip, you can see that here's the echogenic ring. It's connected to the uh, interstitial portion of the, of the uterus. It is clearly separate from the right ovary. And this is a right interstitial ectopic. 
So do not overlook the value of transabdominal imaging, especially if you're dealing with an enlarged uterus and you cannot, re uh, there's a high clinical suspicion of an ectopic pregnancy. So don't overlook the possibility of an inter interstitial ectopic pregnancy. And this is our last patient, a 29-year-old lady with schizoaffective disorder and left lower quadrant pain. Uh, a pelvic ultrasound was performed. The right ovary was normal. The uterus and endometrial lining was normal. However, no left, no normal left ovary was seen. And here are the left and next cell findings. So here we see the normal right ovary, and we see that the left ovary has this reniform shape. Uh, there's a vascular pedicle adjacent. Uh, to the left ovary. However, we don't see any flow within the left ovary. It's in the expected location of the, of the left ovary and the right ovary is normal. So what do you consider at this point? Is this a tumor? Is this abscess, an ectopic kidney, uh, something else? Well, uh, this patient, because of her coexisting uh, schizoaffective disorder, three weeks previously had, uh, prior to this ultrasound, had undergone a CT scan for evaluation of urinary tract calculi. And no abnormality was reported. Uh, and do you agree? And I just bring to your attention this structure here to keep in the back of your mind. 11 days following the CT, the patient had undergone a pelvic MRI and a diagnosis was proposed. So we see a normal right ovary, but what is going on with this left ovary? And this is a nice sagittal haste uh, view of the left ovary. And here are all three imaging modalities together. And what this was is a chronically torsed left ovary with coagulative necrosis. And the delay in diagnosis here was uh, related somewhat to the patient's comorbid disease. She had um, refused to come down for imaging several times, and it just brings out the difficulty in dealing with patients who do have this uh, comorbidity. Uh, so I thank you for your attention, and I hope that I've showed you some challenges related to diagnosis the value or limitations of correlative imaging, management, technique, and psychosocial factors.